Hi, welcome to The Red Booth Show. Tonight's episode features actor George Gallagher. He has a new movie that's just come out and it's gonna be a great time, so check it out. Hello, my name is Emmanuel. There's something I need to tell you. For the 942nd morning, I have awakened in a different spot. I was calling you because I wanted answers. Why I am the way I am. Qu'est-ce qui vous amène ici aujourd'hui? J'ai de mal à dormir. Only to be disappointed. There's this girl. Her name's Violet. Thank you for what you did. But that was getting pretty rough. Come with me. Why do I trust you? That's a theory about particles, not about people. I could be the key to your research. You don't even realize that. Come on! Stay right here. Don't believe me. These are all classic symptoms of hysteria. You had a psychotic break or display of schizophrenia. I didn't tell them! The headaches, the examinations, it's your frequency. They'll find you, man! Broken hands! <laughs> You're nuts. Don't be a perfect. Just wanted to say hello and let you know that I'm out here. That I had a life. And. George, thanks Hi. for coming on the show. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, this is awesome. I'm so happy you got to come today. Me too. I love the setup. I'm noticing so clearly we know we've got a Marilyn Monroe thing going for you. I see Jimmy Dean, Elvis, and Brando mm -hmm. over here. So which one? Can I be Brando? Go ahead. Let's Brando, see this. The kind of thing. Well, you know, there's nothing like the 50s. This kind of throws me back. This is old Brando. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Younger Brando's a little bit more, you know, kind of mumbling. But, but old Brando's much more articulate. He's just very nasal. <laughs> There's a very clear distinction, and of course, my stomach would have to be on the table to do a little Brando. <laughs> That's the old version. Yeah. Yeah. That was Brando, back before so. that happened. Yeah, it's back amazing in. how like he went from like this specimen, and then like mid forties, he had the long like you know Fletcher Christian hair ponytail like Mutiny on the Bounty thing, and then suddenly he was like a house. <laughs> like at what point? I wonder what was the straw that broke the camel's back where he's like. I'm tired of being a sex symbol. I want to be the fattest man in America, <laughs> in Hollywood. Like Orson Welles, I'm going to catch up to you. You know, they were probably just, he's like, I'm tired of being stared at all the time. <laughs> done with it. Done so with now it. they're going to stare at me for yeah. different, a, different, a very entirely different reason. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I oh. wanted to like let people know about the awesome movie that you have coming out. Cool. And I know that it's been released in New York, right? Correct, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it uh, played theatrically at the, the Quad Cinema in Greenwich Village uh, successfully. We were very fortunate. Got a lot of good reviews. And uh, now it's uh, it's owned by Turner. Uh, Turner Broadcasting is is uh, it's playing all over cable in South America and Brazil. And uh, I'm told I sound great in Spanish and Portuguese. <laughs> Can I tell you something funny? So I went online, like looking for a bootleg thing, which is like sacrilegious, you know, because like as an actor, I make my living, so mm -hmm. I don't want to be watching bootleg versions because then I don't get paid. Right. But I was curious to see, like, what did they do here with this dub? So I went online, and like, sure enough, I found this guy who his voice was like five octaves deeper than mine. Right. And he was really angry and very visceral. And uh, it was sort of like you know watching an old kung fu movie. And where your lips were like moving, and then like yeah, it wasn't not quite really synced quite, up. Yeah, yeah. Well, the actress that played the actress that plays opposite move. The movie's called Altered States of Plane. Um, but the main character is Emmanuel Plane, who I play. It's about a guy who falls asleep and wakes up around the world, and he doesn't know why it's happening to him. So he's looking for answers, and it's been happening for years, and kind of happens randomly. Um, the actress Heather Donnie, who plays opposite me, who was in Pitch Perfect and some other <laughs> films uh, recently. Um, they, she was dubbed as well, and it was interesting because they kind of cloned her performance, but my guy like had to bring a fresh take on it. <laughs> so he like made this really angry version of me, and everything was just really, you know, <laughs> and I was watching it, and it was really just kind of surreal. I was like, what is happening? <laughs> oh my god. It was so, so trippy. How many different languages do you think it's been translated into now? 
Well, I know it's definitely done Portuguese and Spanish. Okay. Um, beyond that, I don't know yet. I'm not sure where uh, else it's going to be playing and what's going to happen yet because I don't think it's beyond South America. I don't think it's broadcasting. So it's all over Turner, South America right yeah, now. Yeah, like every country in South America, it's on it's on Turner Network. When is it coming out so. in Los Angeles? Um, you know, I'm still waiting to hear the rollout dates for that. Um, I'm hoping that uh, it should be hopefully within the next year and uh, maybe some other cities as well. You know, it got a really good review, fortunately, in the Hollywood Reporter. New York Times covered it. Uh, That's it. amazing. Um, I, I saw that you had been featured in the New York Times. That's that. What was that like? It was surreal because the picture was like three times the size of the article, which was great. And of course, it's of me naked on the subway. Mm -hmm, um, exactly. Which is certainly uh, you know, something that grabs <laughs> people's attention, uh, especially my, my family. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of a running joke that like I'm always naked in a movie and, you know, and there's no getting away from that but uh it, it was pretty amazing to i know see that it. when you asked me about coming on the show naked i was like i'm sorry but i just can't i can't do that on my show cable you know yeah just, you know eventually one day you know you guys get up to hbo or showtime you know, <laughs> maybe i can come back if, I'm not, if anybody will still want to see me then all right deal <laughs> <laughs> I really wanted to put a deck on my house. The floor was creaking and there were cracks in the wall. I had them put in walls in my basement. Well, the whole thing was done on time, on budget, and not a day of work was missed. Alpha Structural is a top-rate company. I'd recommend them to anybody. If you live in a hillside home and gravity is pulling you towards the edge of the cliff, I recommend you call Alpha. It was a real pleasure to work with Alpha. Um, so, uh, so New Yorkers have all seen your picture and the, uh, the article that came out. Yeah. And it, well, it was interesting too. Cause like there's a shot of me waking up basically, you know, he falls asleep and wakes up in different places around the world. And like the opening sequence of the movie, he wakes up on a moving subway train in New York, which we shot in New York primarily. Right. Um, so it was kind of interesting to see a shot of me naked on the subway because, you know, a lot of it was, uh, you know, guerrilla filmmaking. Um, <laughs> you know, it's an independent film. Right. And uh, no permits. Yeah, I mean, no permits. I don't know if you say that, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> whatever. You know, at this point, yeah. <laughs> it's done, right? Yeah, I don't want to end up like uh, what's his name, Steve Rebell in Studio Fifty Four. He's on TV, and he's like, "What the IRS doesn't know is it going to hurt him? And he gets arrested." <laughs> uh, <laughs> like, yeah, no permits. <laughs> yeah. You know, something I get fined in the mail. <laughs> they're coming after you. <laughs> yeah, they're coming after me. Yeah. pulling me back to New York. So we had people like we had lookout people on the subway platforms, and the funny thing was, you know, <laughs> we had like. You know, people with uh, everybody's using the cell phones and they're going back and forth. And so we had one guy, you know, one PA is going to help me with. I had a trench coat, like a flasher coat that I had to, you know, good. Be ready so you for. blended right in with everyone. So I blended everyone right else in New York. Yeah, no masturbation though. <laughs> and uh, you know, it's really cold. It's like the dead of winter. It's January. It's a freezing cold winter in New York. We get on and I'm supposed to be sleeping, and then they say, "And action!" and I have to wake up. So I'm sufficiently terrified when I wake up. For a multitude of reasons, you know, indecent exposure, this arrest, was real. filming without a permit. Yeah, right. they could get me on a lot of counts here. Right. So I wake up and they're like, we got the shot and cut and we're pulling up to the next station. I see the people on the platform. The guy throws me. So you're like me. covering up. Well, no, he, the PA throws me the coats, but it's inside out. I can't get it on. I don't have my shoes on. My freaking stuff is flapping <laughs> in the wind. Um, so I just kind of put it around me like I'm covering my nipples. And then everybody jumps off the train and they leave me there. So now I have no shoes, Wait, no socks, no underwear. Wait, the crew just left you by They yourself. split because they were worried about getting like caught. That's so not cool. They should have totally. like, they could have like formed a wall around you or you know something. One right? person stayed, my friend Jason, and he was just, but he was hysterical. That's a real friend, right? Yeah, there, he was yeah. a real friend. He was rolling on the ground laughing the entire time. <laughs> so it didn't really have much help to me. So then we had to go like to another stop down. They they came ten minutes. Uh, it was a ten minute walk from where they were. It was in the Bronx of no of all places. And it was like one in the morning and uh, they finally came and I was freezing outside. I couldn't feel my feet by the time they got there. It was nuts. And the funny thing is I had to do this sequence three times over the course of two years. First, when we did like a sizzle reel to raise money for the film. Second, we were actually shooting. And then we actually had our cinematographer who wanted to do, you know, the a camera different work look or something. Yeah. And do something different. So he asked me to, to create a, a look for the film. Would you mind doing this again? And I'm going, are you kidding me? Three years in a row, the third time I'm going to risk my life here. And I'm like, only for you, John. So John Fordham is an amazing cinematographer. Uh, we did it again, and um, you know it, it, it came out really well. So I was pleased with it. So anyway, that's rest fantastic. Is yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you, I mean, you you went to so many different locations too, right? Uh, you said like Amsterdam and yeah, we well. shot another funny story. So I had to wake up on top of the Matterhorn basically without any clothes on again because 
the, the, the deal is when he falls not the asleep, one at Disneyland, right? The, not no? at Disneyland. Okay. Yeah, that would have made different types of headlines if I did that for music <laughs> exposure. <laughs> Pedophilia. Mm, oh no. Headlines, God forbid. Anyway. So, uh, yeah, we're at the Matterhorn, like the top of the ski lift, as high as you can go. Mm -hmm. They actually have an ice cave at 11,000 feet, which is incredible. So I woke up on that, which was freezing um, completely. That's naked. even more cold than New York. Much colder than New York. Right. And, uh, and that was a whole other story. But So we picked this rock that was sort of off to the side of the ski resort on the lift, uh, you know, going up at the very top. And, uh, you know, on one side of the rock, you could, it was like a 6,000 foot drop. So <laughs> one of the PAs is like putting his foot down to see how deep the snow goes. Is he going to fall off the mountain? Like we tie a rope around it to kind of harness. I'm here. Again, we've got the whole setup. We do you, it. So you're tied in so that, you know. You're no, not I'm not tied in. I'm just sitting on this rock. Okay. I have my jeans on. I fall asleep. I wake up. And then basically. Uh, At least they let you have your jeans on in that one, right? For, until they called action, yes. Oh, okay. And then I take them off. But then when it came to, again, cut and I'm trying to put it on, I was so cold and shivering. I mean, there's real goose pimples. There's no CGI. I couldn't get the pants back on now. And everyone's like, just calm down. So now I sit. Now I'm like worried that like my ass is going to get glued to the rock. <laughs> and like they're trying to help me. One of the guys almost falls off the mountain. We finally get back to the ski lodge and I'm shivering and all these people are looking at me in the elevator and I'm thinking, oh, it's probably just because I'm so cold. We get up to the top and we're at the cafeteria and then we look off and we saw the rock that we shot on, which we thought was way off in the distance. Actually, the, the resort is angled 45 degrees, so there's a full panoramic dead center field view of the rock that I fell asleep naked on. So, like, I don't know about you, but if I'm a skier and I'm so coming there's down like, the Matterhorn... And the lights are obviously shining on you, so, yeah. like, everyone's like, oh, there's, you know, skiing past a naked man. Yeah, yeah. Like, I would ski off the mountain if I saw that. I'd be like, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, it was crazy, but, like, yeah, it's, you know, that's the magic of filmmaking. It's, like, everything you plan, like... It's, it's the unexpected. It's, you know, the absence of uh, limitations is the enemy of art. So, uh, you, you know, you can't make stuff like that up. It's pretty amazing. So we did, we did Venice, uh, Zermatt, Switzerland, Paris, some stuff uh, in, in New Mexico. And oh, that's good. Warm, warmer York. climate. A little easier there. It was much easier waking <laughs> up in the desert than the Matterhorn, yeah, I can assure you. <laughs> or the subway. Wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's really cool. It was. It was interesting. Um, you know, we were talking a little bit before about the, you know, sound and being interrupted and things. We had to do a reshoot, I remember, in my apartment. And uh, we're, there was this monologue in the film where there's a phone call. And it's kind of the climax of the film. And I remember, like, just getting to, like, this emotional catharsis. Everything's coming on. Tears are welling up. And I'm about to have this big kind of epiphany. And all of a sudden, I heard this tapping on the window. Because it's like, you know, a reshoot, no budget, guerrilla filmmaking thing. It's my mother who's walked over, like you know, unannounced, and she's tapping on the window and sees us filming, but is oblivious. <laughs> oh, my God. And I'm sitting there, and I'm like, <laughs> I start, like, steam stuff coming <laughs> later. It's like a Looney Tunes cartoon, like the Wile E. Coyote effect, where he doesn't know he's not standing on the earth anymore, and he just kind of falls. And, uh, you know, I slam the phone down. Again, so the ending of the movie, like, completely changed there, too. <laughs> and but it's it's in the movie, you know, it's like the greatest They used movie. it. They're like, that's a perfect shot. Yeah, it's a great shot. That's yeah. what I wanted to be. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty funny. It was kind of a labor of love project. Um, it was a funny story. So the way it came about was actually I came, I was looking for a job, uh, you know, just to kind of survive between acting gigs, possibly as a writer. And I met with a guy who used to run a big movie studio out here in California and said, you know, we're looking for a couple minutes of content, just like little web series, little snippets. We can make more money than that than we can on a half hour or an hour. So we want like the Jolly Green Giant. When we were kids, they had black and white cartoons before the movies that would come out. And they'd say, you know, eat the spinach and you get strong. And then there'd be like a little morality tale in a story. And the next week something would come up. So I was talking to uh, the filmmaker, uh, Nick Galia is the director's name. And I said, you know, this guy, he was looking for something. He said, well, I have, I have this idea about someone who falls asleep and doesn't remember where he wakes up the next morning. I said, well, what if it happens not, you know, 
you know, next door, but on the other side of the planet. And I said, and what if when he falls asleep, nothing comes with him? So he basically has to start his life anew, like no clothing, no anything. And what if, you know, he's so paranoid about when it's going to happen to him and falling asleep that he starts taking drugs to stay awake. So it started to evolve into this kind of dark, tormented character, this Whoa. kind of lone man's journey. And he's being chased by, you know, people who obviously want to capture him and study him for his ability to materialize. Figure out what the heck's going on, yeah. At different ends of the globe. And, and uh, so it just sort of evolved out of that. And then we wound up kind of just... So you yeah. helped to write the story in the script as well, right? Yeah, I did. Uh, you know, a lot of the a lot of the stuff because uh, you know, as the lead character, a lot of times there was some improvisation, but we would always sort of script things. So unless something was really extraordinary, we pretty much wrote it. But that yeah. was kind of part of our process. And uh, yeah, it started with just a treatment that I'd done as a television series, and there was a lot of interest in it. But it kind of brought up the whole like Goodwill Hunting, Rocky story, where it's like, well. I wouldn't get to the play the part if they did it as a studio film, which right. they were interested in shopping around. And then the director wouldn't get to direct it if it were a network television pilot. Maybe I'd have a shot of starring in it. And it was since it was a story that we had developed together, we said, you know what? Why don't we just go out and we make can it do ourselves? This. Yeah, we can do this ourselves. And we it's were the best way to enough. go, man. Yeah, yeah. So we were really lucky too. Uh, you know, we, we got to play in theaters in New York recently at the Quad Cinema and got covered by the Hollywood Reporter and the Village Voice. Loved it. New York Times. And, that's amazing. I mean, you guys have gotten so much press already, and you know, it's just blown up. You guys are yeah. definitely um, taking off. Yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty. It's amazing to have something just like again starts with a phone conversation. He's in New York, I'm in LA, and then suddenly, now you've got a you got a product that has a life of its own, and it goes out there. And of course, the running joke that he always likes to tell people is that I, I always look for an excuse to be naked in my movies, um, <laughs> which is totally like it was just to me. I hate sci-fi movies where people. They, they teleport, they, they, they time travel, they do all these things, and like suddenly, you know, they're closed, the hair is coiffed, everything's exactly the same. I'm like, that doesn't really make sense. Yeah. And so I thought, uh, you know, that's how the idea kind of came to be. But as a, a I always wondered about gag, that. Because on Star Trek or something, you know, how does the teleporter, like, keep the clothes from not separate, like, oh, not yeah. soaking into your skin and you becoming like a meat, they like, have, yeah, they have, they have <laughs> a giant starch. ball of... Clothes of fluff, and of flesh. Right, but right. no, they have corn. They have cornstarch <laughs> teleporters. I mean, the, the, the you know Captain Kirk's uniform is like quaffed and pressed, and his hair is slicked, and you know. Yeah. I guess they can develop it in the future. You just go right like, through uh, that dry cleaner. You know, it's part of the process. <laughs> right. <laughs> so the running gag I had, like, I had a contract that I wrote with him, and one of the like, I just to make sure he was reading it, like, to kind of you know pull his chain a little bit. I wrote that I was the only person who could appear naked in this film. Under no <laughs> circumstances, or you know, he'd be subject to prosecution. <laughs> And so like, did he yeah, read it? Did he, he know did, it? And, but he he like you know could be a little gullible. So, so then he was like, this he thought I was serious, serious. Yeah, and then he started like, telling everyone is, like, George is crazy. He's like, he's, don't, an, don't he's say a anything. he's a narcissist and an egomaniac, and for some reason he has the need to be nude everywhere. <laughs> you know, you know, I'm like Betty Amazing. Page or something. Yeah, you know, exactly. Like, I'm the male Betty Page. <laughs> oh my god, that's did, and did you finally tell him like? You yeah, know, I was messing with you. I did, you? but then he kept telling people over and over again this because it was a funnier gag if he did. So it's really embarrassing. Like to this day, I'll meet people and they'll be like, you know, no, is this the guy? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm like, oh, That's yeah. the naked guy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> oh my God. Well, you know, um, I think that you have amazing acting chops and you're able to Thank do you. a lot of impersonations. Yeah, definitely. You could probably do stand-up comedy too. I'm pretty sure. Well, yeah, yeah. 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 So Kimberly is. So I. So we talked before. I, I found out that you were originally from Australia. So I was telling you, like, I've been recently. Well, hanging I, with I lived pack. there until I was eight years old. Just right. to let you all know, that's the story. So yeah. yeah. So I have a friend, an actor, uh, David O'Donnell, who's uh, very talented, and uh, so when, a lot of times when he talks to me, I'll start to you know pick up on him, and he says, "Yeah, right." So I said, "Why are Australians taking all the jobs from us when they're killing?" He goes. Well, one thing, George, is the like, actors. Oh. He's like, I think they uh, they did a lot more space around them, <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know, everybody's a lot wider. That's yeah, a perfect a impersonation. I know that it is because I know him, and I know that that's exactly what he would sound like. Well, I asked him what he thought. He yeah. said it's pretty good, like your accent for Family Guy, <laughs> but like uh, you know, for uh, I don't know, like something real where you're supposed to be authentic, it's kind of crap. <laughs> and I was like, all right, well. You know, that's why the Aussies are better than us. They're, they're kicking our butts and taking all our jobs. You know? <laughs> they're frighteningly good. Like, the Aussies, the English, I can't tell, like, you know, Kate Blanchett. I mean, I saw Blue Valentine, and I was like, I'm not Blue Valentine. Well, see, I'm a mixture, so I'm like a double Jeopardy right now. Because I was right. born in England. Can you do the accent? Uh, which one? 
What, are there numerous? Well, we should we do English you and have Australian? English, English and Australian. Yeah, there's different. Let's do English first because it works with your hair sort of. <laughs> Isn't this like a 50s hair though? American 50s? It is, but it could be, I don't know. Okay, World I'm getting War nervous II. now. Oh, I don't know. You're, you're the actor. You're the actor. No, wait. Um, you do yeah. a British actor. That's, okay, you're doing Australian. Yeah. Um, well, well, there's a lot of different types of British accents. I'm not sure exactly which one. I can do, do moment, I can do a really bad Liverpool. Let, 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 sure, let's hear it. It's, it's really not good then. <laughs> you just, you just kind of sound like you've got marbles in your uh, mouth. Yeah. yeah. I, I haven't had enough to eat yet. And I'm, I'm still hungry. <laughs> That's pretty good. I like it. I could feel you like... Can you can imagine, had... I put on like 300 pounds for that one. Yeah, I felt like you were eating Mentally. like some kind of like a, a mutton or something. <laughs> you know, or like some kind of stew or goulash or Thank something. Thank you. That's exactly yeah. what I was trying to portray. Like pub food. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, no, I felt the pub food. You, you, you made that exist for me. It was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And um, so what, how about you? Let's hear your British accent. Oh, uh... God, you know, it's uh, it's really quite dreadful, but uh, let me think about it. something. I was going to say something. Oh, I'll tell you a funny story. So when we were filming Altered States of Plane, we had to do some pickups, and I had this friend James who was kind of filling in uh, as a cameraman, and uh, they asked me to do my British accent, and he's from, from London. So uh, we kept shooting in this cave, and, like, it was in Malibu, and, um, you know, again, once waking up naked, it's for the end of the movie, and uh, it's really embarrassing. I, don't, I just met this guy in that morning, and it's just he and one other person. And so he says, George, wait, can, can you put the reflector a little bit that way? George, I'm afraid I can see your balls. <laughs> <laughs> so then I did this like at a restaurant for him, and everybody spit their food out of the table. <laughs> they weren't expecting that. So I was like, how's my accent? He goes, well, your accent was dreadful, but it was quite funny what you had to say. And I was like, all right, thanks. So apparently it's a recurring theme. Like, to Americans, my accents are great, but to like people who are from there, like, it sucks. But at least you're saying funny stuff, so yeah. we'll go with it. <laughs> you're forgiven a little bit. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Well, you know, right. if we had to, you know, of course, you, you I'm work I'm afraid out I can see your balls. Yeah, right? no, that's pretty good. good. Better? Yeah. More proper? I always think of Veruca okay. from Willy Wonka, too. My daddy said that I can have whatever I want. <laughs> so whenever I get lost, I just start doing Veruca. But if I have to be a man, then, it, like, people start looking at me funny. And it's like, all right, I'm Veruca and drag. So. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> well, uh, I'd love to tell everybody a bit more about your history getting into acting. Like, you know, what was, what was the beginnings of your acting career? Sure. Um... Yeah, so I, I lived, uh, I was born in, in New York City, uh, my father's family was from Ireland, um, and I grew up kind of all around the United States, San Diego, I spent seven years in Michigan. So how Irish are you? Um, just the, the good half is very, very Irish. <laughs> um, I'm 50% Irish, my father's family was from uh, uh, Donegal and Fermanagh, the Gallagher's, Gallagher, nice. they say in Ireland. Nice. Yeah, the Gallagher's are from Donegal, and um, my father was actually cliche an ex Irish boxer from the Bronx. Really? And, yeah, he was a prize fighter. He was much older. Was that like the bare knuckle boxing guys? He was a little bit younger than that. He was a prize fighter. They used, it was more like Rocky Graciano, uh, you know, Jake LaMotta, that type of thing. Like he was a middleweight in the fifties. He actually fought illegally because he was an orphan. A whole other conversation, but uh, you know, they were born in the depression, poverty stricken. And so he had to get like a, he had a fight card that it was like an under the table card that his manager would have. So everyone knew who he was, but he had to borrow other people's licenses. So apparently he'd be fighting in the garden or on television and then he'd be at the bank cashing his check and people say, Hey Hector, I saw you on TV last week. Great fight. And you know, it's an Irish guy named Hector and my dad would just be like, what are you talking about? And he's like, oh, that was the name I was using. And they would fight for different things, watches, and then they would hawk the watch and sell it, pawn it off for cash. And he was really doing it as a means to an end. Like they grew up. He spent a lot of time in Harlem in an orphanage, and he had two younger brothers, and they were the only white kids there, and they were getting the crap kicked out of him every day. And the gym teacher finally pulled him over and said, listen, you guys aren't going to make it out here alive unless you learn how to defend yourselves. Like, they were beaten to within an inch of their lives. Whoa. So he started teaching them how to box, and my father never lost a fight again. And he said, you know, you could probably do this, like, for money if you wanted to. And my dad's like, well, I could use some cash. Yeah, there's a good side to everything, I guess. Huh? Yeah. It's so, so amazing. You've, you know totally done an awesome job with that and obviously writing um, this new movie as well being a part of creating it and you know that sort of thing I'm sure there'll be uh, more of that in your future I hope so I think it's always a collaboration like everything that you do you know yeah but there's always people that are steering the ship but it's always you know this is your ship and you know we're collaborating here and yeah and that's the fun of like kind of you know show business movie making whatever you want to do theater it's always the audience is like the eighth character in the play you know even though they're not acknowledged <laughs> that's true yeah Hopefully they have their clothes on, though. 
<laughs> Unlike me. It depends what theater it is. I mean, that's really, true. that's really what it comes right. down to. Yeah. If you're doing puppetry of the penis off Broadway. Oh my god. Did you ever see that <laughs> no. like, on HBO? Oh my god. No, I did not. I won't be in that one, I can assure you. I promise. That's where I draw the line. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> so what's uh what sort of projects do you have on the horizon now? Um so I have a couple things that uh, I'm working on uh, I'm developing. One is uh, a project about a kind of brooding ballroom instructor dancer. Um, it was written by a gentleman named Alan Nee, who wrote a play called The The Man Who Was Peter Pan, which was turned into the uh, Oscar-nominated screenplay uh, Finding Neverland with Johnny Depp. That, wow. That the Weinstein Company distributed. Amazing. And they're also doing Finding Neverland. I think they just played in uh, in London last year. So Alan, uh, yeah, he's writing it and producing. And uh, um, I think John Turturro had done some readings of some a play that was sort of similar to that. And uh, and then I you know have other things that I'm looking at you know, for the for next year, but it should be a pretty busy year. I'm excited, and then of course there's other things, television shows and whatnot that are coming up. Hmm. Well, we'll have to keep an eye on things and check back and go check out your fan page for on Facebook and everything like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. It's George Gallagher, G A W L A G H E R. Cool. Yep. And uh, Altered States of Plane should be slated, uh, you know, for theaters probably uh, later this year throughout the United States. Uh, we already did New York, as I said, and uh, we're waiting for the rollout dates for future cities, but just, you know, you know, keep, uh, keep, keep tabs on it. Yeah, keep an eye out, guys. It looks like it's going to be a great film, and obviously yeah. you lucky people in New York get to see it already, so. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks so much for having me on the show. I really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, definitely. It's awesome to have you. Thanks for coming. Yeah, yeah. It's good to be here. <laughs> yeah, mate. Yeah. He said, <laughs> he said you, you got to not move your lips as much. He said apparently Australians don't really move their, their lips that much like Americans. No way. So I got to, yeah, is that it? Oh, that's good. It depends. Depends right. who you're talking to. Okay. Yeah. Well, perhaps, well, that was his that, suggestion. That's, I don't really that's definitely David, lips. though. That's the way David speaks. Yeah, that's definitely David. Yeah, he doesn't move his lips as much. It's a lot wider. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, it's me. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. Oh, my God. I like the way I feel being Australian. I feel a lot like more in control of things around me. Mm. You know? Like you can probably... Uh, like I feel like John Wayne or something. <laughs> you know what I mean? Crocodile Dundee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Well, all right. Thanks, so, thanks again for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. Great. It's awesome. Thanks for watching George Gallagher on... The Red Booth. Lou, I'll have a milk. Chocolate. George McFly, I'm your density. I mean, your destiny. Amazing, amazing. Am I turning bright red yet? I think I am.